you know, I, again, I live in Florida, so swimming pools are abundant. We live by the ocean. And, you know, the, the chance that a, that a kiddo or anybody really could fall into yeah. a body of water uh, is, is not, it's not low, you know, it, it, it's definitely a real thing. And so if we think of self-defense as self-preservation, everything from, again, swimming to, yes, physical combative techniques of self-defense, but exercise, fitness, it's all a form of self, self-preservation, making sure that we are protecting our physical autonomy, our ability to move and, 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 and go about in the world under our own auspices. What's happening, everybody? Welcome. It's another episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And today I'm joined by George Rago. Thanks for being here, George. I'm looking forward to our chat. If you're if you are listening, you don't see that George and I seem to go to the same barber. So <laughs> you may want to grab jump on the video and check that out. <laughs> uh something something about martial artists and hair. I don't know, maybe. Because because yeah. it's it's not just hairstyle. A lot of us it's it's uh, uh, it's not our choice, right? Like we yeah. we, we kind of had to lean into it. But <laughs> uh, this is not this is not hair talk. This is martial arts discussion. And if you are new to the show, make sure you to visit whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. It's where you're going to find every single episode we've ever done. We're we're creeping up on episode one thousand, and that means if you're new, you've got lots to go back and check out. You know, t- take a take a look. I'm sure there are people that you've heard of, probably people that you know personally that have been on the show over the years. And that's why we keep doing this because it just it, it's just so much fun and it gives so many people a chance to uh, to talk about the thing that they love and for all of you out there to hear about the thing that you also love. And if you want to check out the rest of what we do here and consider supporting us, whistlekick.com is the place to go. Now, this episode, like so many others in the past, is sponsored by Kataro, K-A-T-A-A-R-O.com. You can use the code WK10 on your first order, save 10%. They make the best belts in the world, but they also make other things. I packed for an event this weekend and threw in my Kataro hoodie because it's a comfy zip-up hoodie. They do belt bags and some really great certificates you can have customized and just so much cool stuff. So they're another company out there that's fighting the good fight to spread and share martial arts. K-A-T-A-A-R-O.com, W-K-10. And they've got something for George. George, we're going to connect you with them. Well, cool. Thank you so much. And yeah. Yeah. Well, don't thank me. Thank them. They're they're the ones doing the cool stuff, but they're, they're great yeah. folks over there. We really appreciate them. But let's let's talk about you. You're here. We're talking about martial arts. Uh, before we started rolling, you mentioned you were in Florida, and you just uh, you just went through something. You know, it's. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Here's a question that I posed recently to people, and and this might be a good kickoff. Do you consider preparing for a hurricane as uh, self defense? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I take a pretty holistic uh, approach to thinking about self-defense. Sometimes I'll even talk about, you know, one of the things that I required for my daughters growing up, I always told them that, listen, there's a lot of activities you can do that are very much optional, right? Mm. You could do volleyball or soccer, and those things are great. Once you commit for a season, you got to be in for a season. But the two non-negotiables where you have to do martial arts and you have to learn how to swim. Mm. And I always equate swimming to self-defense, where it is a form of self-protection. So in that same vein, um, you know, to know that there's an incoming threat um, and you have all the opportunity to prepare for it, uh, you want to be able to do that. So without being uh, paranoid or, or, or uh, overly anxious, you do want to make sure that you're prepared for all the, all the potential outcomes that, that, uh, that could mm-hmm. Arise. Thankfully, we were pretty lucky. We, you know, we lost some power, but you know, you got to do all the essentials: load up on the water, have food for a few days, make sure that you're uh, ready to evacuate if you needed to evacuate uh, in, in a hurry. And um, and you know, that self preservation idea is very much at the heart of what I do in terms of teaching. Our approach to martial arts is very self defense based, and so um, yeah, self defense is a, is a, is a, is a is a mindset as much as it is a physical skill. So. We try to apply that to uh, whatever circumstance arises in, in day-to-day life. Yeah. I went on a, a, I don't want to call it a tear, but guesting on a number of preparedness podcasts I, uh-huh. last year because the, there's so much synergy 
in the way martial artists tend to approach life and the way, you know, some people don't like this term, but, you know, uh, preppers or self-reliant people, right? right. There, there's just so much of that. And, and the overlap is pretty huge, which is, which is why, why we were doing that, you know, trying to bring people into the show here. And I find that the biggest difference is just the, the labels, right? You talked about water and food and swimming. And I, I think for most martial artists, and, and I'm curious how you bring this in when you talk about martial arts, whether it's to, to other martial artists or, or to people who are not training yet. You know, you mentioned something like swimming. If you look at the statistics for children, Swimming is a huge, huge skill. Probably if we were just going numbers, it's probably more important that kids learn how to swim than martial arts. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so how, how do you, stuff. how do you connect those dots for people? To say so, but, but you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, you know, I, again, I live in Florida, so swimming pools are abundant. We live by the ocean and you know, the, the chance that a, that a kiddo or anybody really could fall into yeah. a body of water uh, is, is not, it's not low, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it, it, it's definitely a real thing. And so if we think of self-defense as self-preservation, um, everything from again, swimming to yes, physical combative techniques of self-defense, but exercise fitness, it's all a form of self self-preservation, making sure that we are protecting our physical autonomy, our ability to move and, 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 and go about in the world, um, under our own auspices is, is, uh, Mm. Again, it goes back to that self-defense mindset that you, you mentioned the preppers. I've always kind of had the similar thought, you know, yeah, you see the extremes where people go all out, but that self-reliance idea, I mean, it's called self-defense, not you defend me right. or, you know, you have to be your own bodyguard. You have to be prepared uh, as, a, as an individual unit to take care of yourself in the worst case scenario, whether it's a disaster or a hurricane or falling in a body of water or heart disease or a physical attack. So that, mm. that again, it goes back to applying that self-defense filter as, as a way um, of, of, of approaching things. Again, I try to be careful in emphasizing that we don't want people, <clears throat> certainly I don't want my students to walk around uh, paranoid, thinking that, you know, behind every bush there's a threat, but, uh, or every time I get into a car that I'm going to get into a car accident. But when I get into a car, I do put the seatbelt on, mm -hmm. you know, I prefer to be in a car that has an airbag that as opposed to one that doesn't have an airbag. If I'm, you know, in the kitchen, uh, I'm not paranoid that there's going to be a fire at any moment, but I'd rather be in a kitchen that has a fire extinguisher as opposed to one that doesn't uh, rather know how to use it. Uh, so, so that kind of, again, applying that self-defense filter is, is very much at the heart of, uh, of, of what we do. Hmm. Hmm. It, it's what, what I'm hearing is, is a word that I like to use. It's mitigate or mitigation, right? Yeah. Because none of us will ever be perfectly prepared. If, if we, if we, walk down the street and we're saying, okay, there could be someone behind that bush. It's a really low risk. So I'm going to walk by that's mitigation. Or, you know, if there is someone behind that bush, I've got a, a better than average chance of defending myself. That's mitigation. But if I look at that bush and say, I'm not going to walk by until I am 100% sure I am safe. Well, that's, that's where life just locks down. And everybody draws those lines of what is what is mitigated result differently. Some people choose to carry additional tools on their body at times when they are out in the world. If they are, you know, hopefully if they're legally permitted to do so, but you know, that, that's that's a whole other conversation. And just as we talk about swimming as a skill, or maybe having you said there's a hurricane coming, let's make sure we have plenty of water, let's make sure we have plenty of food. It's, it's that, it's that approach that within the martial arts world, why do we learn to protect ourselves? Because we probably don't have time to wait for someone else to come to our aid. Why do we have extra water? Well, there are plenty of people around the country right now who are saying, you know, maybe we should have had a little more water. Maybe we should have had this, that, or the other, and hopefully they're better prepared for the next potential event, which it's that lather, rinse, repeat cycle that we go through. We do it in martial arts too. Yeah, absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. You know, it's one of these things where uh, I like what you said just a few moments ago about you, you're, 
there's never any guarantees in life period right but you you certainly can implement certain certain behaviors certain habits uh certain ways of being that increase your probability of success right mm. so uh, an analogy that i guess uh one could use is if you do you know let's say you you, you want to prevent uh, a bad health you know uh disease cancers heart disease whatever the case is there's there's certain things that you can do that increase without guaranteeing there are no guarantees your probability of of, of, of mitig mitigating those things, right? You know, it's like, hey, get, eat some vegetables. Would you get some exercise? Have something for stress relief. Get some good sleep. And you can implement all of these really good habits. Does that mean that there's a 0% chance? No, it doesn't. You know, you, you, you could be 33 and end up with some, you know, um, life-threatening disease. That's true. But, you know, not smoking, eating well, all of those things are only going to make it more and more likely that you avoid those diseases. And if, if God forbid, something like that does hit you, you're in a more robust state to be able to combat it. And so we can apply that same idea again to walking down the street or preparing for uh, a hurricane or a life event. You know, what are the things that I can do that, again, understanding that there's never a 100% guarantee that I won't be attacked or I won't come down with some disease, um, but I'm increasing the probability that a, it doesn't happen, and B, should it happen, uh, I've given myself the best possible chance for uh, negotiating the situation successfully. Yeah, yeah. Th there's a there's a podcast out there that I've actually been on a couple times in the early days. It's a huge show now called the Survival Podcast, and and it's I like the show because it's a, it's a much more uh, balanced approach to exactly what we're talking about, right? It's um, the, the, the gentleman that hosts the show comes at this very subject, you know, the same subject, a lot of martial artists come at, how do I keep myself safe? He comes at from a non-martial perspective. And so I like that because it rounds out how I think, cause I'm, I've been training a long time. You've, I assume been training. How long have you been training? How long have you been doing this? I started in 91. Okay. So, so a little bit. 30, 30 <laughs> some odd years. Yeah. So it's, it's really hard to look at the world at not as a martial artist. Right. I, I assume, right? Like I, I can't. So so this guy Jack looks at it in a different way. And he's got something that that I, I want to acknowledge that this is his uh, um, concept. The likelihood that a situation is going to happen is inversely proportional to the number of people it'll affect. People mm -hmm. lose their job every day. That's significant for you the entire state of Florida doesn't lose their job often or ever, right. right? So you've got the big dramatic, the the Hollywood sexy scenarios that, I mean, let's face it, we, you know, we all watch John Wick and we go, yeah, yeah, I want to do that, yeah. right? Like I, I could, I right? Like we want to be able to pull that off. But what is much more likely that you carry yourself down the street with confidence and prevent yourself being mugged, right? Happens just to you, but it's much more likely. And those are the things that we need to go after. Yeah, completely agree. Just, you know, you mentioned watching, walking down the street with a certain confidence, right? That in and of itself, that awareness, the confidence, the energy that you project as the kids say, the vibe you put out there, that in and of itself is making you a harder target as opposed to a soft target that, that uh, again, in terms of mitigation, you're, you're, just in the way you comport yourself as a martial artist in and of itself is a self-defense measure, you know? So I agree completely. Yeah. I, I, I want, I want to talk more about how you got started in a moment, but whenever this, like this subject comes up, I, I try to make sure we mention it because I think it's so important as a soft skill for instructors to teach that confidence and make sure posture, et cetera, is being reinforced at, at all ages. But also it's to my mind, it, it discredits the, the even having the argument of this art is better than this art, right? Because we've got people, if someone comes through and they gain confidence, if they feel like they are more likely to survive and, and stem disaster from an attack, statistically they are because there have been studies where they will take violent convicts, felons, and show them a group of people, show them different people walking down the street and say, 
who would you pick as the target? And they're all picking the same people. Right, right. Why? Because of body language and posture. So I don't care if you've learned the what, what we could somehow survey as the objectively wor- well, subjectively worst martial art of all time. If it right. gives somebody confidence, they are less likely to get into a situation and thus it is working. Right. At, le- at least on that initial level. In, 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 that, in that way. Yep. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. So you've been training for a while, 30 something years now. I'm, I'm going to guess we're, we're fairly close in age. Yeah. So you started training as a kid. I did. I was eight okay. years old, eight, okay. nine, eight, nine years old. Yeah. When I started okay. out. Awesome. All right. So, uh, all right. So I've got just a couple years on you. Yeah. You can, you can tell if you look, if you look, there's, <laughs> there's, there's, it looks like there's a little more white in, in my hair than in yours. Why did you get started? Were you, were you, were you part of the Ninja Turtle surge? So that's, um, that's a little early for turtles. Yeah, no, no. I, when I was a kid, Ninja Turtles was definitely, definitely a thing. I, I can't say that it was Ninja Turtles that got me involved, although I was, I, you know, as a kid, you, you, you eat all that stuff up, right? Sure, sure. Uh, I, you know, the truth is, uh, and I've, I've explained this in the past, but I don't have a, a great reason um, for, you know, there was this initial spark. Uh, but I can just tell you, and, and my, my parents, particularly my mother, always tells the story that just as I, essentially from the womb, I, I can't tell you why, I was obsessed with everything combative as a kid, you know, whether it was uh, Ninja Turtles or uh, WWF wrestling or a Rambo movie or, you know, an old Western, anything to do mano y mano, I just was totally uh, fascinated uh, with it, you know, and so you know, I'm wrestling my friends and my brother. And, you know, if, if the, one of them wasn't available, then I'm, you know, I'm body slamming a pillow or, you know, Macho Man Randy Savage off the top rope, you know, that it was just like an obsession constantly. And so my, my immigrant parents from Portugal, uh, you know, I, I, since I was three, four or five, I was begging my mom, you know, can I, can I, can I learn how to do karate? Everything was karate to me uh, back then. And, uh, you know, I had kind of this hyperactive, you know, if I was born now, they probably put me on some kind of, you know, pill for ADHD or something. And uh, she didn't think it was a great idea to like teach this kid how to do it for real. And, uh, but I, you know, continued, you know, and never really relented. And uh, at some point my father told my mom, you know, like, hey, let the, let the boy try it for a month. He'll get it out of his system and, and well, now we're we're on a we're on a podcast talking about it, so it never really left it never really left me. But uh, but yeah, so I got I I, I uh, entered the dojo uh, at about eight years old, uh, and there's a little bit of a side story about why it was that dojo that I went to. But in any case, I went to that dojo, the dojo of a man by the name of Paul Orell, uh, Shihan Paul Orell, who is the founder of our particular system of jujitsu, and um, uh, he started training in 1950, United States Marine, and. Um, I, wa- I was blessed to walk into that dojo and I, as a kid, kind of developed an obsession with this particular building and this particular place that I had seen them practicing martial arts at. And I walked into his dojo and um, uh, the rest is history. And I, I, although he's passed on now, I still consider myself a student of his and, uh, and basically have spent my adult life uh, promoting and teaching his, uh, his, his approach to martial arts and, uh, and uh, yeah, the rest is history. Mm. Well, that's cool. You said there was a side story there. Yeah. So, so I that? had this kind of general obsession with martial arts, yeah. right? Um, but growing up, uh, I'll try to abbreviate this. My my mother and my godmother were extremely close, okay. and where I grew up in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, and she lived in a, 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 a side town called Newington. And in order for us to get to my my godmother's house, we had to take a very particular route, kind of the most efficient route. And so because my mother and my godmother were so close, we would go all the time. At a particular, uh, about a halfway point between my house and, and my godmother's house, um, there's like this old yellow, kind of musty yellow building that they always had, you know, the, the window shades up. And I would see these guys throwing each other around in there. And as a kid who was already obsessed with this, a martial arts thing and wrestling and army movies and the rest of it, I would see, you know, anytime I went to my godmother's house, we'd stop at the light and there were, there were these guys throwing each other around in there, you know, grabbing each other and throwing each other. And 
Um, so I became obsessed with this particular place. Like that's, that's the place I need to go to. And truth be told, whenever my mother would go to my godmother's house, I'd always like ask, can I, can I go? And if I'm being honest, it really wasn't about going to her house. It was hoping that I'd get that 30 second stoplight, uh, so that I could watch them through How the window. How old are you at this time? Oh, this is, you know, I'm talking five, six, seven, eight years that... old. And Just the, uh, the idea that you would invest that much time for that short of a reward. I mean, that's, yeah. that's beyond and it really, and it really sucked when we got a green light because like, oh man, I was just praying that we'd, we'd get the red light so that I could wow. you know, be there a little bit longer. Sure. So anyway, when my, when my mother finally relented and was going, okay, we're going to let you try it. Um, you know, and she was, you know, not that there were many options, but there were some options. I go, listen, there's, there's no need for you to even research. That's, that's the place I need to, mm. I need to go to that. I, you know, it felt like there was a little world inside of there. Uh, you know, like that, that it was a portal to a different world. And, uh, again, I couldn't articulate it at the time. I was just a small boy, but I had this obsession with martial arts, but then this kind of sub obsession with this particular dojo and listen, it was a beat up old building. There wasn't anything luxurious about it. It wasn't, you know, a trophies at the window. Uh, it was, it was an old American Legion club. And, but I go, this is the place I need to go to. And thankfully I went in there and, um, and, and everything has taken off from, I don't know what my life would look like had I not walked into that dojo because every facet of my life since that point has been truly dominated by, by, by the martial arts. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of the, the, the origin story. Okay. So you're eight years old yes. and you, you manage to find, and, and, you know, I, I've lived in new England my whole life. So okay. we're talking the early nineties where, you know, you're, you're talking about jujitsu. So I'm assuming we're talking Japanese jujitsu, stand up jujitsu rather yeah, than BJJ. Uh, no, no, not BJJ. Uh, it, it is a is a a, a, a very self defense oriented Japanese jujitsu system. Okay. Um, uh, we always, you know, uh, we have a very holistic approach sure. where uh, a lot of um, how should I say this? And I, and I and I I promise I don't say this in any kind of. A, uh, I guess jujitsu now is is, is very. Um, I always think of it as like it's become more hyper specialized, right? You have judo where they're focusing a lot on throws and BJJ is very groundwork oriented. And we had a very holistic approach. We did grappling on the ground, standing throws, everything again, though, filtered through a, a self-defense filter. So uh, it really was not, uh, although we had competitive training and sparring and that kind of thing, but it was never sparring with the idea of that was a one point move, two point move, that's mm -hmm. a three point move. It was just to get that uh, resistance and that aliveness um, uh, and pressure test the techniques. But but anyway, yes. So it was a very comprehensive uh, self-defense system um, at, at its heart. So there, there are a couple things that I, I think are worth pointing out there. And the first is that that's an uncommon sort of stylistic approach even today. And 30 years ago was even less so. And so that, that fascinates me first off. And secondly, that also doesn't sound like the type of school that's going to be jumping up and down wanting kids. So were there separate kids classes? How, how did, how did that all play out? Yeah, there, there definitely was a, a, a separate kids class, but, uh, Shihan Arel, although he was absolutely incredible with children, he was very, very good with children. He always treated them like little adults. Mm -hmm. Um, and although, you know, don't, don't misread me, of course, you know, you, you want the kiddos to enjoy themselves mm -hmm. as they practice, but it, you know, this was not, um, and I'll say this as diplomatically as I can. This was not like Chuck E. Cheese martial arts. It, he was teaching, he was there to teach you authentic martial arts. Not, it wasn't, you know, there were karate birthday parties. There were, it was, you know, we are doing, and again, I, like I said, he began training in 1950. So mm -hmm. he was a man of a certain age and, 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 uh, uh, really was a pioneer in, 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 in martial arts and, and in New England and Connecticut specifically he opened the first yeah. karate school in the state of Connecticut. Uh, and um, so, yeah, I mean, he had a children's program, but it was, it was, uh, but there were no children black belts, for example. It was, you know, it, you had to be at least a mid teenager, you know, before we could even begin to flirt with the idea. And that assumed that you had started training at six, seven years old. So there wasn't a separate youth track. 
is what you know there definitely was not a separate youth a black belt was a black belt regardless of age yeah, absolutely absolutely and um and uh so yeah we we he he was uh, great with kids uh and and he loved teaching kids actually women kids he was always kind of a fan of the underdog he himself despite being a top shelf martial artist and a marine you know he was five foot three small man uh and so always had a love for the underdog so when he saw you know the kind of nerdy kid or the small woman or even the guy who was a little bit more meek he always gravitated in that direction because he felt like you know that guy over there who's super athletic everyone can benefit from this but he's probably going to be okay mm-hmm. but the real mark of a teacher would be you know can i make that person capable of like really capable you know uh, not just they feel good and feel better and have more confidence that's important but he was obsessed with the art has to have teeth it has mm-hmm. to really be applicable it has to be something that is tangibly useful uh god forbid should you actually need it and and um and uh, yeah that was very much his uh, his approach to to uh to our jujitsu wow. okay the the origin stories are always interesting and we've heard that but what i think is even more interesting because statistically we all know far more people start martial arts than remain in martial arts but you stuck with it was there a moment do you remember when you said this this is my thing uh was there from a the moment? car you suspected it was your thing right but was there a point when you went yes this is what i want and need yeah so i don't know that there was one particular moment but there was a you know as a and again i wouldn't articulate the articulate it this way when i was a child because you know i was a child but I think my initial fascination, uh, where, where that may have happened for me, that kind of switch over where this is 100% my thing, is as a child, you know, I remember the first time I walked into that dojo, I saw a young lady by the name of Amy who was, you know, maybe five feet tall. And she was throwing these guys around and, you know, not, not, uh, not, not in the, you know, super compliant, let's do a demonstration kind of a way. But like she was, she was drilling these guys. Hmm. And she was very petite, but she was so fast. And when I saw her, th- you know, it looked like magic to me is the way that I explain it. And like a boy being obsessed with, uh, you know, watching a magician, you know, like, wow, like, that's amazing. How is he making this disappear? Or mm-hmm. in this case, how is she making that guy just fly over and slam into the ground? Uh, I was obsessed with it like it was a magic show. But at some point, you know, like if you become a magician, you learn the craft, the trade craft. You know, how, how are you making the illusion happen? How, how is that throwing technique or that choke or that arm lock or whatever? How does that actually work? And I think what switched for me is that I actually became more obsessed with, uh, if we were using this analogy, less the magic show, but the craft of how you make the magic happen to begin with. Mm. And so kind of as a technician, even as a young person, as a young teenager, I became really uh, obsessed with the craft, not just the end result, you know, the, wow, the big throw or the big dramatic technique or the flying kick or whatever the thing is, but like, how do you actually make your, how do you get your body to conform itself to your will to make, to have the technical acumen to, to make, make that happen. And, um, and so at that point, when I started to, uh, really fall in love with not just the wow factor of, of, of the martial arts and how cool something was, but I mean, it was cool, but it was cool in a different way. It was cool that you, you, it was just amazing that someone who was much physically smaller and weaker objectively uh, could be so physically capable. And so I became obsessed with that. And I I really became obsessed with, I always found that the, the Japanese and martial, martial arts in particular for me kind of struck this balance between uh, you know, these guys didn't look like Conan the Barbarian or Hulk Hogan or these wrestlers. Like they were, you know, this guy could be your accountant, hmm. but you'd never know what this person was capable of. And that kind of dualism of having this average looking Clark Kent like individual. I was just thinking who, superhero. Yeah. Who, who, who really was Superman, you know, uh, but his disguise was Clark Kent, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> or it, it's like that idea that, you know, this guy's walking around and he's an electrician or an accountant or whatever it is. But underneath that is this extremely capable person. 
and you wouldn't know because they're not boastful about it. They're not, they're not, they're not looking to list their resume about how accomplished they are as a martial artist. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, uh, in, in the professional wrestling world, they were bombastic and over the top. And, you know, I, I, I got drawn to that idea and, and the more and more I did get drawn to the technical aspects, the philosophy of, of the Japanese martial arts, the more it crystallized that, you know, this, this was the way for me. And, and, Mm -hmm. um, that there was not going to be, you know, a retirement date from this. This was an ongoing lifelong pursuit. Wow. Okay. For a lot of us who started training as children, the fact that we were doing martial arts had at least some impact in how we related to our peers. You know, for, for me, it was interesting because I definitely took some flack for it, but yet no one wanted to go physical because they, I'm small. And yeah. so they were quite happy to pick on me for it and and verbally discredit what I was doing, but nobody wanted to test it and find out if I actually knew what I was doing. So, you know, that worked out to my advantage. What was it like for you? I, I would say my experience was slightly different uh, in that uh, one, uh, I don't know if it's kind of our Mediterranean back, you know, we're, we're a little bit hot blooded people. So uh, especially as a younger man, I was, I was very, uh, although I, I genuinely was never looking for a, for a fight, I, I was not one to walk away quite so easily, let's mm-hmm. put it that way. And so I had a few scraps early on of because of the, you know, yeah, you know, Kung Fu boy, you know, whatever. And, you know, as soon as it went hands on, but that only happened once or twice before, like, word got around like, Hey, you know, leave Rego alone. You know, he, mm-hmm. he'll dump you on your head kind of a thing. So, Good. uh, and again, we're talking young, you're talking, yeah. you know, middle school age, that kind of a thing. Um, but what, in terms of relating to my peers, it's interesting because there did come a point, uh, in age where there was a it kind of met a crossroads mm. where you get to an age where, your peers are now becoming much more interested in girls and parties and cars and let's go out to the movies. And, and I was going, yeah, but I got to get to the dojo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you're, you're like at the dojo all the time. Like just miss a class and let's, let's go, you know, to the mall and pick up chicks or let's, you know, go to, you know, to soup up our car or whatever, whatever the thing was. And I'm just, I just was like, no, that's, that's not it, man. I gotta, I gotta be to the dojo. We're cool if it's an off night, but there's no way I'm missing training to, to, you know, go, go sit in an arcade or something, you know? And that made me a little bit of an anomaly in that way where, where I was, I was, you know, I had my friends, I was part of the, part of the group, but you know, he's a little weird. He like, he's strangely obsessed with this thing and he's not willing to sacrifice uh, a training session to, to go to the mall or go to the beach or whatever the thing was. So, uh, and I'm, and I'm really happy that that was the case because as we all know, growing up, you know, sometimes really young people get into, you know, smoking, drugs, drinking. And I can genuinely say that the dojo and, and, and the art kept me, I always had something to do with my time. Um, uh, the art gave me goals. It gave me a purpose and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't searching for something and seeing if it was at the end of a bottle or, you know, if, if chasing this particular girl was going to do it, or would I be the cool kid if I attended this party? I really had no interest in, uh, don't get me wrong. I was interested in girls and having friends, but not to the point that I was willing to sacrifice uh, pursuit of this, this thing that I found so meaningful. And, and that, I think at that age was uh, different than. What, than, what about uh, school? We, I, I've heard this sort of story before and it usually comes with academics falling down that list as well. So uh, I actually, as I got older, became a better and better student. And I, and I actually credit that to martial arts, just mm. being able to focus and discipline. And also, frankly, like I've got to get this done and do it properly or my parents are not going to let me go ah, Okay, train. Like if the grades start to slip, you know, like that was not acceptable. So, you know, something's going to get cut out. And my, and my thing is martial arts, you know, that was kind of my kryptonite that where they could, if they pulled that from me, you know, so I, and I knew that, and I, and I knew that, that that would be the case. So 
uh, it, it actually kept me in line, you know, so I would, I would, my routine was to, you know, do the school, school thing during the day, obviously come home, I'd hit the homework straight away. Mm-hmm. I needed to get the homework done. I didn't want this black cloud hanging over me so that I can go train and go do whatever without having to come back and, oh man, now I've got to do homework and I've got to, it was like, get it done. You know, and it came as I got older, actually, to the point where I'd, you know, ride the bike or immediately, immediately head to the dojo from school. So, you know, that was, again, I I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but this kind of obsession with the martial arts kind of made everything else fall in line because I didn't want to lose this thing, whether it was lose it because my grades were slipping or lose it because there was a party on Friday night. I just didn't want to lose this. So I had to keep everything else in, in proper order to make sure that I could continue to pursue martial arts. What about when you, when you left high school? Uh, yeah, so I, I did actually, I started uh, my dojo fairly young. I was, uh, uh, you know, uh, barely an adult and uh, I moved to Florida with the intention of starting the dojo. Really? Uh, yes. Okay, why Florida? Yes. Uh, true. Well, the, the thing was my, my actually ties into high school and college. My parents, uh, a few years before I graduated high school, had built a house here uh, in Florida, kind oh, okay. of as a snowbird situation. Yeah. And the idea was that when I headed off to college, they would, they would, uh, you know, move down. And uh, uh, longish story short, at some point I had expressed to my sensei, Shihan Arell, that, um, you know, my parents had a, a place down there. And our association at that time basically had nothing in the South. And he goes, you ever think about, you know, you know, maybe, maybe you could be the guy to kind of lead the charge mm-hmm. down there. And I had never really considered that. Um, and again, I was, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old, pretty young guy. But he uh, he actually gave me, and he was very conservative with these things. But at, at a certain point in our association, he awarded me instructor certification when I was 16 years old, and which was like the youngest certification he had ever given anyone mm-hmm. ever. And he had, exp- you know, he was very confident in me, more confident than I was, uh, apparently. And, uh, you know, he kind of had planted the seed in my mind. And at some point, um, I said, you know, what if, what if, what if we did that? And it ended up being that I moved down and, uh, finished, finished the very end of high school here, started a small dojo, you know, in a rec program. It wasn't, you know, the dojo storefront I have now, but a small program and just little by little by little, um, the dojo grew. So, uh, even with like, uh, college, um, you know, I went to a, a local, uh, uh, community college, but it really was just an excuse so I can say, hey, I got I got a little degree, but it was really I need to I need to pursue the dojo. And uh, eventually, little by little, you know, within five years of starting the dojo, we had the largest dojo in terms of uh, numbers wow. in our association. Well, that's great. And uh, that continues to be the case today. And, so and you were uh, going to college while you're doing that. Yeah, absolutely. That's a lot. Yeah. It's a yeah. lot for for an 18 year old kid to to do that. Yeah, it was a lot. I, I, I kind of, uh, rightly or wrongly, I kind of put it in my head that uh, this had to work. I did, you know, it's like, uh, it was a sink or swim situation. Mm-hmm. And as much for me and wanting to do it, and I did want to do it for me and to have the dojo. But uh, again, going back to my sensei, he he was so confident in me to give me that instructor certification. And then let me like kind of be on my own. There was no affiliated dojo around, just out here by myself. And I, I, I needed to make it work to kind of prove him right that, um, you know, that his confidence in me was well-placed. So mm-hmm. I felt uh, in the best sense of the word, an obligation to make sure that, you know, if he, if he put, put that certification on me that young and let me kind of lead the charge in a place that was kind of uncharted territory for our system of jujitsu that, uh, that I did it and did it the right way. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, that in some ways still continues to be my motivation to make sure that, you know, we represent his approach to doing things properly. Yeah. So, so here you are, if I'm doing my math, right. You've had a school for more than 20 years. Yeah. Actually this coming weekend will be 25 years. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's amazing. Is it, do you love it more or less? No, I, 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 it's definitely not less. If, if anything, I feel that every, uh, 
and I, I, I almost hesitate to say it because it sounds like the thing you're supposed to say, but I, I really genuinely do mean it. I feel like every time I, 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 I go to the dojo and then I leave the dojo and I leave the dojo, I'm literally pulling out of the, the parking lot and I'm going, I can't wait for tomorrow. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I, I'm, I'm every year more and more in love and fascinated uh, with, with, with this. So, so yeah, no, it's definitely, I don't, I've, I've never really, um, you know, in training and as a technician, you feel plateaus and frustrations, but in t- ne- never in the sense of like, oh, I'm done with this. I need to get away from this. I've always, you know, this is, I have a, a long-term relationship with this art, you know, and through the ups and downs of life, the art is always there for you. And, um, and no, so I, I continue to, to, I feel like my love for it only, only grows. And, and I'm at a point now in my teaching life, despite being a relatively young guy, uh, not as young as I once was, but relatively young that we're now starting to see, you know, the second and third generation, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, of people pop up and you, I look at some of my, my younger black belts and go like, you know, these, these guys, uh, and I mean, in the best sense, you are your replacements Mm -hmm. and, and growing and developing confidence in those replacements. Like the art is going to be in good hands, you know, long, long after I'm gone. If, you know, if this is the quality of people where we're turning up, you know, and I mean quality, not only in terms of technicians, but of character and appreciation for the, the art and the history of the art. Um, and understanding that we are part of a, a lineage, a tradition, and that every generation has the ability to screw it up. And so kind of making sure that it gets passed on, like, you know, Gishin Funakoshi, the founder of Shotokan used to say that you pass it on straight and well, you know, to the next generation is uh, very important to me. And, and I'm now at a point in my life where I can begin to see that I think we're going to be okay, that if something happened to me today, the dojo and, and, and the students and the art will continue to mm. propagate forward just, just fine. It's a great feeling. Yeah. That's, yeah. You know, I, I, I wonder, you know, I, I, I like to think of things through these, you know, time machine hypotheticals, you know, what, right. what would it be like if you could go back and talk to eight year old you, or we could bring eight year old you forward and show him what that obsession from a red light in the car turned right. into, or, or, you know, what your instructor would think, you know, clearly he saw something in you and believed in you and he, that faith was well-founded. You're still going, you're still passing on and sharing what he gave you. And that's really cool. Have you identified anybody in that, in those black belts that remind you of you or maybe oh, even have, younger? Is there, is there a young George in there? I think there are several young Georges mm-hmm. in there. Uh, quite a few. So, uh, you know, they're, they're, your they're their own unique person and personality, but that kind of, that spark where you see something, you know, I, I've got a, I've got a young man uh, that I have in mind right now. I have a few of them, but I got one in mind right now where I'm, I'm thinking he's a Brown belt and I could see him like, no, I'm, I'm not going to go to the football game on Saturday. Why? Cause I've got this, I've got this dojo thing going on. And I don't, you know, I've never said, Hey, miss the football thing. Like you can go, man. It's okay. Like you, you're not, you're not persona non grata. If you go see the the, the football game. But it's it's internal. It's with him. He he he's he's making the choice, not because of peer pressure or his sensei is twisting his arm. Like he just has it, and he has it, and several other have it. Uh, have that have that thing where they just are truly um, obsessed. Sounds negative, but they're 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 passionate about yeah. the art, and and, um, uh, and 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 yeah. So so I I I I'm, I'm blessed in the sense that I don't I don't feel like there's a um, you know, you're relying on the one guy that you need, you know, we've got, we've got a, we've got a family, a community of, of, of martial artists, um, both, at, you know, more senior students, but, uh, you know, I see some of these kids who are 11, 12 years old and I go, that kid for sure, you know, has everything it would take to be a, a, a future high level, uh, instructor. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, there was an earlier time where you, you, you hope and you, and you work towards, I hope that happens. I hope this thing doesn't, you know, die out if something happens to me. And we're, I think we're, we're well past that now. Oh, that's awesome. Such a great feeling. Now you mentioned to me prior to us, you know, kind of starting officially here that you had written a book. 
That's does right. That, I, I, I'm, I'm, does that book fit into this idea of passing on? Because as you're talking about that, it sounds really, you're, you're passionate, not just about training, but on passing on the passion for training to others. So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that book fits into that mold. That idea? Yeah, good guess. So uh, the title of the book is the founding. Into the of... audience, that was a complete guess. Like we didn't, that, <laughs> we yeah. didn't set that up at all. I just, I, I, I tend to read between yeah, the lines. I, I vouch for that. Yeah. Uh, no, you're, you're right. So uh, my book, it was a bet. It continues to, to, to sell really, really well. Actually, oh, we great. published in 2022, February of 2022. It's titled the uh, the founding of jujitsu and judo in America, and uh, basically. Uh, goes from the very first encounter uh, between the art of uh, jujitsu or known documented encounter of jujitsu uh, with an American uh, in Japan, which happened to be President, uh, former President Grant, who went to Japan post-presidency and saw a demonstration uh, that actually included a young man by the name of Jigoro Kano, who went on to be the founder of judo. And we kind of track that uh, forward in time to about until about 1964, where judo then became introduced into the Olympics. And so, yeah, uh, my, my, my obsession with the art and its history and kind of that lineage and making sure that the story is told is important. One of the main motivations for me writing the book was very much to make sure that some of the, one of, one of the goals, not, the, not, not exclusively, but one of the goals was to make sure that some of these very prominent teachers did not become lost to time where they just become a faceless, nameless person who contributed to the art being passed on uh, because there are big names that everybody knows, you know what I mean? Uh, especially these days, uh, and rightfully so, they should know those names, you know, maybe someone like an Elio Gracie, but there's a lot of people who, or Jigoro Kano, right? There's a lot of people along the way who were, maybe don't have the name recognition, but were just as instrumental in many ways in making sure that the art was passed on. Um, and so the, the, the book, The Founding of Jiu-Jitsu and Judo in America, uh, kind of documents the story of the arts um, uh, being brought from Japan into the, United, into, the, into the West, but with a particular focus on, on the United States, uh, and a lot of the characters along the way who, who, um, who uh, kind of uh, spread the art in the United States and their unique visions, because it was uh, very much like America, a melting pot. That it wasn't one unified vision the entire time. And we we talk about how the art kind of evolved uh, or splintered into a kind of a more sport oriented approach to versus a more truly martial oriented approach, and mm -hmm. and and how how that kind of uh, uh, developed. And I tried to write the book in such a way where. Even though it deals with history, it's not. Um, it's kind of written like a story in a sense, where you're following certain characters, and it's not. Uh, I always say it's not drudgery to go. You know, in 1882, this happened, and it. You know, it, it should feel kind of an easy read for people to be able to follow along with, uh, with uh, some of these just incredible characters, and you know everything from, again, the first encounter of jujitsu uh, with an American to Teddy Roosevelt having a, a turning the, the, the recreation room of the White House into a dojo. It's probably my uh, favorite how, U.S. historical martial arts. Oh, and people, fact, people don't yeah. realize how, how, you know, before uh, the UFC in 1993, there was already a jujitsu boom, you know, you know, 1904, 1905, you know, and then it's kind of stalled out a little bit. And then World War II happened and that, and, and we talk about how World War II impacted oh. the art as a, as a whole. And then, Again, it had a kind of another peak and then it dropped again. And then again, MMA came around and now the martial arts, you know, that kind of the 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 ups and downs mm -hmm. of uh, of the popularity of, of the art and and the different um, the different faces that the art has 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 taken over over about a century. Wow. Cool. And how long did it take to write that book? It sounds like a lot of research. So, so truth be told, I, I, I kind of cheekily always say, you know, I've been writing the book in my head for, for a long sure. time. So once I actually started going, uh, it, it took me about eight, nine months, uh, you know, a lot of late nights and uh, hours of writing. Uh, but it was, it was, I basically had it in my head. But when you're writing a book, especially a history book, 
you need to make sure that, you know, that historical fact that you have in your head, that you can actually source that, that it's not just so like, no, no, where, where exactly, I know, I know this piece of information, but I actually got to make sure that, you know, it's not just George Rago said it's the case <laughs> and being able to, to, to go and find, you know, the old newspaper article from 1910 that documents these proto MMA fights that were happening long before, mm -hmm. you know, um, even the art made it to Rio de Janeiro, for example, you know, like these things were happening in England and London in 1902, 1903, you had a guy by the name of Yuki Otani, who was called the Pocket Hercules. Uh, he was 19, 20 years old and uh, came from Japan and was like literally having these challenge fights uh, after doing a demonstration. Anybody in the audience want to give it a go? Uh, and all he would require is that you wore a, a jujitsu or judo gi top. And it was kind of the, the shtick was if you could go this long, you'd get this amount of money. And he, this guy fought thousands of, of these these matches uh, in like a five year period, you know, just, uh, you know, and even Mitsudo Maeda, who eventually did make it to Brazil, you know, what was he doing in Cuba? What he was in the United States having challenge matches. He was in Spain, Portugal, and we kind of go through his lineage before he even gets to Brazil and how he was in the United States uh, propagating the art as well. And, and uh, how he splintered from his teacher because of his obsession with, with uh, well, he was here to promote the art, but he was also on a personal adventure. He was a young man and was happy to promote judo slash jujitsu. Those terms were kind of interchangeable at the time, uh, but was kind of on a personal voyage and uh, needed to make money as a, mm -hmm. as a young Japanese guy in a foreign land. And he had this skill. <laughs> and so uh, anyway, kind of just kind of tying that all together to give people a, a more complete picture as opposed to just a kind of a neat uh, narrative. This guy taught this guy taught this guy. It, it's a bit more uh, more nuanced and complicated than that. I, I, I give you a lot of credit for putting together a research driven book because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, longtime audience members know we have a book division. We've put out a few dozen books. Most oh. of them are not research driven. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the only one, actually, I have it here. The only one that I think, actually, not not entirely true. We've we've got this one, which uh, Twelve Months to Health, which is, mm -hmm. you know, applying mar martial arts methodology of incremental progress to regaining some health. Yeah, but that. there's a ton of research in that book because we needed to back up. You know, if you do this, here here are the benefits. But I know also that, um, and it's funny, the other one that I'm thinking of, uh, Jenny's book, The Origins of Master Hopkick because it's set in, there, there are some settings in Southeast Asia and Australia that she got, made sure she wanted to get all the historical facts done. And I know the difference between that and like, I wrote a novel. Right. And I know how much faster that novel turned out because I didn't have to fact check anything versus the length of time it took for, for those books to happen. So uh, good on you for, for doing that. That sounds like a fascinating book and I'm going to have to check it out. So yeah, where would people get that? Is that, is that a, say again, Amazon? Say again. Where would people grab yeah. that book? Uh, Amazon, you can get like all versions of it, paperback, oh. hard copy. It's on Audible as an audio book. It's on nice. iTunes. Did you read it? Uh, I did not. Aww. However, yeah, yeah. No, I, I get I get a bit of grief for that. But but uh, uh, very, very quickly, I had initially no intention of doing an audio book. And then one of uh, actually our black belts from Connecticut he does, he had, he, he took like, uh, um, uh, what is the exact term? Basically he does a, a, a voiceover work, yeah. right. And he does like commercials and he started doing this and he had just started and he goes, Hey, you know, have you thought about doing an audio book? And I go, I don't know if I want to, you know, I just, I just got this thing out there. It was plenty of work. The last thing I want to do is and he goes, well, I'll, let me, I need the practice. Let me, let me do it. If you don't like it, no problem. Uh, but if you like it, you know, we'll go with it. And so he did it. He, he read it and I go, you know what? It's not, it's not bad. Let's, let's roll with it. So, so it's his voice, but I've trained with him for a long time. So uh, it's still, it, although it's not me, um, it's not just for me, it's not just kind of some random voice actor. It's someone that I've, I've sweat and bled on the mats with. And, and uh, I know he's passionate about the art as well. Nice. And so it got him some practice. It got us the audio version of the book. So it was kind of a win-win for everybody. Awesome. And what's it called again? The founding of jujitsu and judo in America. There you go. There you go. Nice. Yeah. And that's not a picture of you. No, no, no. There's no pictures of me on there. No, <laughs> no. 
small one on the inside, you know, on the about yeah. the author page, but that's it. The, the book doesn't revolve around yeah. me. Are you going to write another book? Um, I don't have a concrete, uh, you know, idea where I'm going, yes, this, I'm going to write about this, but, but there's a good chance. There's well, a good chance. What about that next historical block? It sounded like it, it kind of tails off in, in the sixties. Yeah. yeah. So what about when, that, when that 60 to, to early nineties, you know, that pre UFC period. Yeah. The, you're, you're, you're very much on track with where kind of my, my brain is at with it as well. Um, I'll be honest in telling you that uh, there, there, I got to be careful here. There's, there could be some controversy with, with, uh, again, even some of the. Uh, I feel comfortable with the way that I framed it in the book because I can back everything up historically. But you know, there is a narrative about um, when you kind of dispel narrative. Sometimes people take it as like an attack. And I'm like, listen. Yes. For example, what happened in November of 1993 with the UFC and the Gracie family, like that was a big deal. There's no, not dismissing that. Not However you look at it, it was a big deal. Yeah, it, it wasn't, it, we're not trying to diminish it, but there is almost 100 years uh, of documented fact in Brazil, in London, in the United States, showing that things like this were going on, kind of style versus style matchup. It was not... You know, like people were doing this for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't just kind of, even even the UFC didn't, you know, just come out of the ether, even with the Gracie family in Brazil. Like they, there was there was a history of this thing kind of happening. And so, um, yeah, so you, you want to write a book that is true to the story, but at the same time, people don't think it's like somehow, um, you know, you're trying to take a particular spin or, 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 downplay anybody's contribution so um you know it, it, there's definitely a more in me in terms of writing but i don't have a you know a manuscript that i'm working on at the moment okay, okay. um if you if you want to check out a book that i think navigates controversy well that is similar it's um a killing art it's mm -hmm. a history of, of taekwondo by uh, alex gillis okay who was on the show many years ago and it's a, it, it is a it is a brilliantly well done book. He was a, a, a journalist and did a fascinating job. So you could, you could use that as a, I don't, I don't want to say a reference, but as a, as an example of somebody who's gone before and waded through, I mean, the man got death threats for this book. Did he really? Wow. Yeah. 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 And if you read the book, you understand why. And anybody out in the audience who has read the book understands why. Well, I'll, be, I'll definitely be checking that out for yeah. sure. Yeah. Cool yeah. book. Shout out to Alex. Good guy. Well, George, this has been awesome and, and fascinating and I don't want it to end, but it kinda it kinda has to at some point here. Um, so let, let's do this. Where can people find you? You talked about the book, but how about website, socials, stuff like that? Yeah, so we're we're pretty active pretty much uh, everywhere. Our website is Florida, complete spelling of Florida, Jukido, J U K I D O dot com. We're on uh, uh, Instagram, Facebook, if you search my name, uh, Jukido Jiu-Jitsu. Jukido is the style of Jiu-Jitsu that we teach. Um, you know, you'll, 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 you'll find us for sure, but we're, we're out there. Awesome. Um, yeah. So, and I, and listen, I'm really honored to be, uh, to have been a guest. I know that uh, we're, we're approaching a thousand episodes. <laughs> so so crazy. congrats to you. That's, that's, Thank you. you know, uh, Thank that you. speaks to the martial arts spirit of continuing to forge through little by little by little. And, uh, um, so congrats to you as well. Thank that's, you. that's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. And, and to you and to anybody else that's checking out the show, you know, early on and in, in understanding what we do here at Listle Kick, please don't go back to the beginning until you've decided you like this show and what we do. If you go back to episode one or 12 or 50, um, just give me some grace. I had somebody, I had somebody comment on an early, a fairly early episode. Uh, you know, maybe it was in like, the 100s, maybe even the 200s, which, and they said, does this guy have to smack, I think, smack his lips in between everything he says? And he was clearly talking about me. And I was like, look, I had no idea what I was doing when I started this and, and I've gotten better, but it's only from, I'm just going to keep showing up and doing it, you know, like, like martial arts, like everything else. Like, I mean, that book on help, like just 
if you can get 1% better, there's a compounding effect. And Yeah, well, you were a white belt back then at this thing. And obviously, yeah. you're, you're much yeah, better now at it I'm, now. But... I don't know what I am now, but, you know, it's fun. And I, and I get to talk to people like you and we have a good time. Well, I'm, I'm honored by by the invitation and I hope that things keep on rolling in a positive direction because, yeah, you know, and, and, and same for you. And so I'm going to ask you, uh, I'm going to ask you to, to close us up here in a minute, but I'll, I'll give kind of like a, a pre outro uh, to the audience, you know, whistlekick martial arts radio dot com, whistlekick.com for all the things that we're doing. Remember, we, we've got events and we've got books and we sell shirts and we're, I'm wearing a hoodie. I think this one's been discontinued, but, you know, we've got a rotating uh, selection of of gear and swag and uh you know all the episodes and everything and again shout out to kataro k-a-t-a-a-r-o.com wk10 get yourself 10 uh seriously the best belts in the world i i if you have one you understand if you don't you, you think you do but they're amazing and so george i'm gonna ask you to close us up you know 99.9 percent of the audience here is martial artists so what do you want to leave them with from our conversation today? I think what we were talking about there at the end, you know, it's not it, through thick and thin, you know, you're going to, your life is going to have ups and downs, but you have to, it's, it's not who's good. It's who's left. Mm. Just keep investing in your training. You know, it's like, it's like the, the piggy bank, you know, you throw a penny in there and you throw another penny and it doesn't seem very substantial, but if you keep, you keep going, you keep doing it and you keep doing it, you know, um, it will it will compound over time and uh again you know as, as the podcast shows long-term martial artists you know the concept of i'm sure you're from with kaizen little improvements day in and day out those little investments especially for martial artists who are a little bit newer on the path stick with it keep keep showing up keep training day in day out you won't regret it 